on the Rayakri Bypass Surgery, what we have learned so far by Dr. Rajiv Piris. Dr. Rajiv Piris currently operates in Asiri Group of Hospitals and Navalok Hospital. He worked in National Hospital of Colombo and Lady Ridgeview Hospital, Colombo. After receiving consultant status, he moved to private sector in 2002 and also did a five-year stint as a senior lecturer and senior consultant in the Sultan Kabus University Hospital, Oman. In 2001, he stopped his thoracic surgery practice and in 2009, he stopped doing pediatric surgery after moving on. So he's going to talk about his vast experience in off pump bypass surgery, what we have learned so far. Over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, chairpersons, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I have been honored to deliver this plenary on a very complex subject. It looks simple, but it is complex, believe me. Uh, so, coronary artery bypass grafting is a surgical procedure performed to relieve angina and reduce the risk of death from coronary artery disease. The surgical concept of coronary artery bypass grafting has remained more or less unchanged for more than 60 years, whereas the strategies for achieving CABG have evolved considerably. Uh, in 1945, Weinberg embedded an internal mammary artery into the myocardium directly. Uh, he did a fair series on that, but cardiopulmonary bypass was first used by John Gibbon. This is his machine and himself. They, he had three models. The second one was the one that had success. And uh, he moved to Mayo Clinic and did vast amounts with this, but not coronary artery surgery, mainly atrial septal defect. The first CABG was performed by Robert Gortz, and uh, he did a REMA to RCA using a modified pair clamp, uh, and he probably didn't do any more surgery than the first one. The Sabiston did uh, Safina spin grafts, and Kolosev, uh, a military surgeon from Russia, did the first lima to LAD with suture anastomosis. Thereafter, Favre, Loro, and Green did vast series with CABG on pump. So slowly, the gold standard was established, cardiopulmonary bypass with cardioplegic arrest and a sutured anastomosis. Now there are problems with cardiopulmonary bypass. Firstly, there's a vast circuit where the blood comes into direct contact with a foreign body, foreign material, and then there is a pump head driving uh, with a large mechanical force forcing the blood along this uh, foreign material. There is hypothermia of the body, ischemia, both by a non pulsatile flow and fluctuations in blood pressure. Microemboli are seen in the circulation. There is also heparinization and reversal. All this gives rise to a complex prothrombotic and pro-inflammatory response and uh, marked protracted activation of several molecular pathways from immediate to several days. So systemic inflammatory reaction with immune mediators, platelets, current coagulation activation, increased oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction. Actually, some of these are seen in surgery without the pump, but they are very small compared to the uh, cascade activated by cardiopulmonary bypass. So if you just go through this, there is bypass uh, circuit mechanism giving hemodilution, hemolysis, blood loss to the circuit, and a systemic inflammatory response. And the systemic inflammatory response gives rise to a huge amount of things, coagulopathy, platelet dysfunction, renal function, and acute lung injury. Then there is another set of things, anticoagulation and reversal, prolonged hypothermia, prolonged ischemia, mechanics of surgery, embolic complications, all give rise to their physiological derangement. So various people approach this problem in various ways. Some people wanted to coat the, uh, the tube with various things. Other people thought, why do you want to stop the entire heart? We can stop the part of the heart and not choose cardiopulmonary bypass. This gave uh, rise to the concept of off-pump bypass surgery. So if we did off-pump surgery, you can get rid of huge chunks of the problem that we were facing with on-pump surgery. So this was the theory. And if you look at the history, uh, William Long uh, uh, did by bypass without pump by necessity, but it was J. Lloyd Ankeny who actually intent did op-cap surgery. Uh, by 1995, there were several industrial uh, changes, a lot of things were in production, and op-cap, off-pump coronary artery bypass became a standardized reproducible technique. So, off-pump 
bypass surgery is coronary artery bypass surgery without using a heart lung machine now i must stress that today's talk is mainly on off pump coronary artery bypass surgery cabg uh, uh, and conventional cabg through sternotomy but we are not going to talk of other forms of off pump surgery that is mid cab Uh, doing off pump surgery through a small anterolateral incision then doing a larger anterolateral incision and what is called thorac ab multivessel grafting and then miss or minimally accept coronary artery bypass grafting use you using uh, ports to uh, instill tabulators and of course robotic assisted endoscoping endoscopic coronary artery bypass we're not going to talk about all this but just the first two now of cab also has demands good stabilization of the target area access of posterior and lateral wall of the heart visualization bloodless field and hemodynamics uh, stable hemodynamics uh, so the consensus on of cab throughout history has been uh, there are a lot of advantages of of cab but Uh, CABG on a arrested flaccid heart with a bloodless field was a surgeon's favorite. So opcap surgery remains clinically a uh, technically more demanding and has a steeper and longer learning curve so we did not get much thumbs up uh, as opcap surgeons. How many CABGs are done off pump? The trials of course about 50% but if you look at the US uh, national registry it's about 15 to 30%, Japan 65%, India excess of 90%, my own personal series uh, about a decade and a half ago it was 91%, it has come down to 88% in the recent past. And uh, of course you need a patient for surgery For opcap, you need a surgeon. You need an anesthetist. Actually, the anesthetist is called the principal assistant for opcap surgery. You need proper good assistance. Then you need a coronary stabilizing device. You need a epical dis, uh, displacement method, intracoronary shunts, or and coronary stairs, slings, or and a blow mister. So these are the stabilizers. Stabilizers initially they came as compression devices and vacuum suction devices. The vacuum suction devices have become more uh, more power, more popular today, and compression devices are almost not in use. Uh, so displacing the heart, push patient position, ghost doubles were used, traction and of peri uh, on pericardial stays. But the main two techniques remain deep pericardial stitch and apical displacement device. Here is the deep pericardial stitch. The initial uh, drawings were like the one on the left. Uh, you have we have uh, been recommended to use a, a rubber or a silastic snugger on the uh, on the uh, the the string or use a gauze piece uh, for protecting the heart. Now the apical displacement devices, the popular ones are the Medtronic system and the Marque Marque Acrobat system. So if you look at one system, uh, Medtronic from the 1997 very cumbersome large stabilizing device today to elegant small one, this has been the evolution of one system. Blowmister is an adjustable fluid gas CO2 mixing device. It is necessary to create a predictable blood clearing mist stream under pressure. And uh, then we like to use these uh, intracoronary shunts. It provides clear vision. It uh, maintains distal blood flow. It reduces blood blood loss. It prevents embolization of carbon dioxide, and of course, it prevents the surgeon from taking posterior wall sutures inadvertently. Now, adjuncts to opcab mandatory to have the pump ready and perfusion is ready in case hemodynamics become uh, bad and we have to convert to on pump case. Defibrillator paddles, uh, paddles and uh, provisions for IABP optional is cell saver, autologous blood transfusion, transvenous spacing, transesophageal echo, cerebral oximetry, and uh, other equipment to measure blood flow in the graphs. Anesthetic management is very important. The cornerstones and headings of this is safe induction and maintenance of general anesthesia. Strategies that offer offer utmost cardiac protection, good communication with the surgeon, management of ischemia, hemodynamic stability, prevention of hypothermia, and uh, pain relief. 
Now, strategies to prevent hemodynamic instability or to maintain hemodynamic stability are many. The cornerstone, of course, is management of inotropes and aggressive management of perfusion pressure. In addition to which, one or more of the following can be used. Extensive right pleurotomy, deep uh, vertical right pericardiotomy, uh, right decubitus Trendelenburg position, ischemic preconditioning, electrolyte optimization, construction of proximal before distal anastomosis, grafting of LAD before manipulation, avoidance of uh, RCA grafting and grafting the PDA branch, prophylactic pacing wires to overcome bradycardia, prophylactic intraurethral balloon, balloon plumb for high risk cases. Now, contraindications, relative ones are small arteries, calcified arteries, intra myocardial coronary arteries, diffusely diseased target vessels, poor conduits, and large hearts. Absolute would be hemodynamic instability, decompensated heart failure, or cardiogenic shock. Ischemia, inferior laterally displaced hearts because they cannot be, uh, di- you, you know, manipulated to give good vision and have, have a good uh, uh, hemodynamics. Hocum. Many of the Indian series have deaths with Hocum patient purely because the inotrope management is very difficult. You give inotropes and the pressure really comes down. Uh, concomitant value are the procedure. Now, the above picture shows an aneurysm resection which I did. Uh, I wouldn't use soft pump. There are one or two surgeons in the world who says they can do it under off but it is spine chilling surgery and I wouldn't advocate that and many people say that is an off on pump case recurrent troublesome arrhythmias are considered an absolute indi- uh, contraindication circumflex artery grafting in the AV groove is considered also an absolute contraindication so where do we stand actually with the opcab when you read this you realize it's not just one pendulum it's many pendulums swinging uh, left and right it has been performed for more than 30 years and we have had three, de- three decades of debate and intense scrutiny a massive increase in published research 115 good randomized trials more than 60 meta analyses and opcab the most stringently evaluated modality of coronary surgery and it's the controversy still remains vigorous. So early consensus uh, co- concerns was from many trials, but these two uh, m- mark uh, trials that gave us a lot of uh, headache as opcap surgeons. But Khan's trial, uh, we found out that they had given a low dose of heparin intraoperatively. There was lack, lack of du- dual antibiotic therapy after that. They used old-fashioned stabilizing devices, and uh, they, uh, they, they are, uh, their sub- exposure was suboptimal. Then. Um, uh, and the second trial was also having similar things. I mean, they, they had very, uh, very inexperienced surgeons and had disproportionate amount of endoscopic vein harvesting. Then came a hallmark trial, the Ruby trial, and that was not uh, a very uh, uh, encouraging trial. It said the statistical significant, most of the parameters were bad for pump surgery. Luckily, we had more trials following few years later, the coronary trial, and very recently, the GOP-CAB trial, the German one with high risk uh, patients now if you look at this uh, you find oh, I don't have a point uh, oops sorry yeah you find that uh, in the uh, ruby trial the female population was less than 1% the females have a different outcome in uh, coronary artery surgery and their uh, sort of very low levels ha- ha- change uh, things to the for the bad surgeons anybody who had done f- uh, uh, 20 op caps could uh, become a primary surgeon 60% of these surgeons were registrars and uh, they could do three three just three op caps before trial uh, with three territories, uh, they can do 17 Lima to LADs of cab and do three vessel one, uh, sorry two and then come to the trial. So they were very inexperienced. When it came to the coronary trial there were 100 of cabs done by the surgeons. The average on the German trial was 514 uh, of cabs before the trial began. So actually the other ones gave better uh, better, uh, or better uh, results for op cab. So let's go to several situations and see how we fare. Complete mess of revascularization. A lot of trials, including the one shown on the left, has uh, said that completeness of myocardial revascularization is a cornerstone in coronary artery bypass. So despite all the advances, we have problems with inferior and posterolateral wall uh, mobilization. The Ruby trial gave uh, very bad uh, results, uh, but the coronary trial said there was no difference in repeat revascularization at five years. 
Then we had others. This big trial had a big difference between the incomplete revascularization on the top. And now, come to the second second one on the bottom. Uh, now, that had 13,000 patients, and it showed a very interesting fact. It shows that if you did off-pump surgery, just one territory was not revascularized, and you would have a problem with survival. Whereas in on-pump surgery, you can go up to two territories that were ungrafted and only then that survival would be affected. So uh, then of course we had other problems. Definition of uh, IR uh, the, uh, the varies remarkably between studies. Uh, then also uh, in, in, incomplete uh, revascularization can be a surrogate marker of uh, great, the greater burden of complexity of coronary disease. So there are so many well-conducted randomized control trials demonstrating at least comparable completeness of revascularization. We didn't calculate in our series revascularization, but uh, the red slice is three vessel disease. All the other ones are less, and this is like my results in one study I presented uh, on the top uh, of the number of graphs form of of pump. Uh, so, patency and graph failure, numerous studies and meta analysis have showed graph patency uh, slightly lower with uh, venous graph patency, slightly low, lower with opcap, but the arterial graph remained the same. In addition to this, Ruby showed that PDA, not only Ruby, several other studies showed that PDA graphs perform poorly on opcap. Now, as usual, something, there's one trial at least which says something else. The prevent database study, uh, the, they, they showed that venous arterial graphs have the same patency with both techniques. So surgeon experience, very important. Uh, this uh, trial I have uh, quoted on the left, uh, that showed very clearly individual surgeon experience and hospital volumes on OPCAP have long been considered an uh, important de uh, determinant of outcome. Uh, so uh, in trials that have shown poor outcome for uh, OPCAP, surgeons have shown very limited experience of OPCAP. This trial, the Ruby, uh, I told you, uh, the, the surgeons are very, uh, very, very, very uh, new to OPCAP. The next trial also gave bad, uh, bad, uh, bad results for COPCAP, but see, the surgeons did one to five OPCAP operations before joining the trial, and there was a very high rate of conversion, 12%, and mortality was also high. Almost all trials show better surgeons have better outcome. We, I have let, listed a lot of trials that have, uh, I mean, fair number of trials which have excellent outcomes uh, so, uh, so by good surgeon experience. Now, we have one thing that says something else. One study did not find any association between OPCAP surgeon case volumes and mortality, and that's a study given. Uh, so we have, everywhere we have at least one that does not say. Now, neurological risk, I must say there is no pendulum, which is rock solid. All the things point out in one direction. However, I must say the big hue and cry about cognitive impairment is a short-lived affair, and by measurement by modern standards, it does not, uh, uh, it's not effective anymore. And what we have is something else. OPCAP may be associated with reduced stroke. Patients with carotid stenosis may have a potential benefit from OPCAP. In patients with a history of previous CVA, however, OPCAP does not confer uh, a risk of risk uh, benefit. Uh, Okay, endocrine failure, chronic kidney disease, again no pendulum, so almost everything shows the same thing. On-pump surgery is associated with more problems, two meta illness and many studies show the same outcome. CKD patients had lower early mortality and morbidity with OPCAP. There was no difference in long-term survival, however. Vein graph occluded sooner with OPCAP, arterial graphs behave equally with both. Now this is my own little uh, twist into chronic uh, uh, renal failure. The yellow slice is non-dialyzed patient. The right, uh, the red slice is uh, dialyzed patient. They all had creatinines of two or more. You see a slight rise uh, immediately post-op. Then at day five, just before leaving surgery, they almost all came down. At day ten, they came down further. You know, uh, you know, as at home. And then uh, subsequently, of course, after three months, it almost came back to uh, 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 their pre-op levels. So liver disease, again, same thing all over, very few papers. Cirrhosis substantially increases mort mortality of any surgery, any cardiac surgery. On pump surgery increases mortality, op cap surgery does not increase mobility or mortality in cirrhotic patients. However, if it is associated with liver dysfunction, morbidity and mortality are increased by op cap as well. Impaired LV function, early mortality is low, stroke is less, MS is lower, long term, 
are similar in most of the trials. So we have a lot of normal patients coming. Uh, this is my uh, uh, impaired LV function. Uh, 28% of patients that on this uh, data set had l lower function. This patient had 17%. This is my lowest ejection fraction, 70% on the date of surgery. He is still living. This was done in 2002 and he is still very active and he calls me every year. Then Impaired ventricular function, sometimes this is a different data set. Uh, we looked at uh, high risk patients, 94 patients. We looked how their, uh, uh, what happened to their ejection fraction after surgery. 85% uh, improve, 14% to the same, 1% in red decrease. But however, this patient collapsed in the car park, was brought in a stretcher, resuscitated, and then he uh, had surgery. Nobody remembered to do a echo just after his collapse. So we don't know where we are then there. Uh, advanced stage. Now, again, OPCAP in mortality, in hospital mortality is lower, stroke is lower, and we have first two studies saying that. But the next two studies say that on cap, op cap are both the same. So we don't know where we stand. We still are waiting. We have, we are operating on a very, very young population. Wherever we went to present our data, they said your population is very young. Now the female sex. Here there is no, uh, no, uh, no pendulum. Everybody, everywhere you read, there is no evolution. The results are absolutely the same. Uh, now, most of the uh, most of the studies, numerous studies, say the same thing. High females have higher operative mortality, higher major major complications, higher ventilated time, higher length of hospital stay, and opcap will narrow the and elim or eliminate this disparity. Women treated with opcap had outcomes similar to men, and uh, they are undergoing either opcap or oncap. So for women, yes, it is a very good procedure. High risk patients benefit better with uh, um, with uh, uh, off pump, and uh, you can see high risk patients benefited from off pump. Off pump, and uh, this is our high risk. Euro score of five or more is considered high risk, and we had a fair share, 38 percent, and we had very good results with this. I swear that I have not manipulated this uh, table. This was at that time two of the most, uh, three of the most uh, re reverend uh, sources of outcome. In the last line, we have our figures, and we have the other figures uh, on top. So very comparable. Ours were actually slightly better. Now the long-term survival, most important factor, uh, factors for good results is completeness of uh, grafting, experienced surgeons, and survival was the same for upcamp, uncap after appropriate statistical adjustment. That's what most of the studies said. Then we come to intraoperative conversion from off pump to on pump. Uh, this happens for several reasons: uh, hemodynamic instability, small size of coronary arteries, intramuscular coronary arteries, ischemia, arrhythmia, uncontrolled bleeding, graft occlusion, calcified vessels, need for concomitant surgery decided on table. So, if it happens in a crash situation, of course it's an emergency. But if it happens before distal anastomosis, it is called elective. The, uh, the elective one is very well tolerated; hardly anything changes. Acceptable acceptable rates are of conversion is below 10, and most of the big studies have it uh, below. 10. Uh, then uh, these four studies on the left, they have given an intraoperative conversion predictors and this list is like this, the most of what I have read before. And the emergency ones, conversions cause problems, they increase mortality risk, they increase uh, risk of ischemia, they increase stroke, in, uh, renal failure and prolonged ventilation. Hospital costs. So uh, I have, uh, there are numerous data on this. Uh, up to, you can see the first few, off pump is better, the last three, the on pump is uh, the better cost. But the on pump better cost except the first trial by Chu, which uh, has a lot of uh, cost there, I mean there's a difference of, a big difference, but others are 6% and 1%. Uh, so this remains like that. And Sri Lanka is different. Sri Lanka, the difference between op cap and on pump is at least 250,000 in the cheapest private hospital. Uh, that is because we reused the octopus. And when I presented some data, first thing I was uh, I was made to promise by uh, the Medtronic never to publish this. Uh, when uh, immediately after I presented this, 
a uh, lot of people started talking and i realized this is the world's first ever systematically collected data set what i did was a very simple idea i just named the octopus which came into the theater and then followed whatever happened to that so uh, we had an average of 9.78 patients per octopus going up to 14 and the starfish 15.8 going up to 19 by the time we presented this i had used a starfish 48 in 48 patients so the evidence for opcap the there is abundant excellent quality large studies in reputed journal spaced in time validated uh, that the status of opcap as a safe and effective uh, technique these are the good large retrospective non randomized studies then we have so many single institution randomized control studies then we have so many meta analysis and systemic reviews uh, so in uh, in concluding i would say abundant published evidence that substantiates the benefits of opcap there is still apprehension about doing this procedure opcap is a challenging technique uh, needs some uh, help on getting through the uh, initial phase uh, it should be considered a different procedure and for safety of uh, negotiation the learning curve the recommendations are appropriate patient selection individualized grafting strategy peer to peer training graded clinical experience planned patient optimization it is an attractive strategy for treating patients and the next generation of cardiac surgeons must understand and learn this procedure in an environment of complex patients being referred for revascularization i'll just touch upon this posterior in aorta uh, this is a circumferential uh, uh, calcification of the thoracic aorta it uh, has been uh, up to 7.5% in patient requiring surgery aortic cannulation and uh, you know put in the cross clamp Uh, is difficult also the top end anastomosis in cab is different di difficult uh, the 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 interventions in the uh, aorta aorta is uh, met with um, uh, higher mortality higher stroke and uh, aortic dissection so opcap with aortic non touch which means using lima rima not doing a top end anastomosis using the rima as a composite graft after yot anastomosis is an excellent uh, simple effective strategy other strategies are available with uh, very specialized ways of cannulation and alternative cannulation sites but they have given problems right throughout so what is the talk take home message Uh, it's significantly cheaper excellent short term long term results are at at least as good as on pump a better technique was certainly women renal impaired uh, liver disease and high risk patients excellent option for porcelain aorta but one should always remember you should do what you think is fit what you are comfortable for one particular patient so cardiac surgery is a team effort every member of the team plays an important role which cannot be overemphasized i take this chance to thank all my associates doctors anesthetists uh, assistants uh, the ward staff the icu staff the technicians the perfusionists everybody who's worked with me for some excellent results over the years so i close with sharing with you this extraordinary opcap experience i had in 2006 where we were the first patient of pump uh, without general anesthesia on a high epidural high cervical epidural uh, and a local block to get the uh, radial he was listening to music and talking to me while the the the, the second photograph is while i was harvesting the uh, lima then while i was close in the chest he had uh, 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 water to drink and one and a half hours after the coming to the the icu he had his lunch a delayed lunch thank you very much thank you very much dr peris for that very comprehensive and very interesting lecture uh Do we have any questions? We have little time for any questions. Okay, thank you, Rajiv. And uh, in the absence of any questions, we'll move on to the next plenary.